Good afternoon, and welcome everyone to Alvarez and Marcel's webinar on identifying cash tax savings opportunities on your fixed assets. Uh, my name is Phil Antoon, and I'm acting today as a moderator and one of the three speakers for today's webinar. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to provide an outline of the webinar agenda, cover some important administrative items, and then introduce our speakers for today. And with regards to the agenda, it's important to note that the goal of the webinar today is not to provide a regurgitation of the regs. It really is to provide a practical explanation of the asset disposition regulations, how companies can benefit from the regulations, and a pragmatic approach to measuring and reporting the results of an asset disposition study. I think the way we want everyone on the webinar today to look at it is that this is more of a how-to rather than just a repeat or download of the regulations. And as we just walk through the agenda items, as you'll see some of the topics, we'll talk about the overall regs, the asset disposition specifically, talking about pragmatic and practical approaches, to the regulations, talking about the benefits, and how you'd actually conduct a study. So again, we want everyone to be able to walk out of today's webinar with, uh, at a, at a minimum, minimum, an overview of what are the asset disposition, disposition regulations, how can I possibly benefit, what can I do to measure that benefit. Administrative items. The webinar is going to be one hour in duration. One hour of CPE credit will be provided. Participants must provide responses to at least three of the four questions that we will be asking throughout the webinar. So we'll ask four questions throughout the hour, and you'll have to respond to at least three of those questions to earn CPE credits. We absolutely welcome questions throughout the webinar. We will try in some cases, if possible, to answer the questions as they come through. Other questions, we will have a, a Q&A session at the end for some time. And if we're not able to get to all the questions, we'll ensure that we can respond to, uh, to people after the webinar. Last item on the administrative side is that the deck can be downloaded. So we've designed the deck to be a takeaway for you um, that you can review afterwards. Let me now get, go to introduce, the introduction of our speakers. As mentioned, I'm Phil Antoon. I'm a managing director with Alvarez and Marcel in the New York office in the evaluation practice. I have over 25 years of experience conducting valuations of companies, intangible assets, and tangible assets. And I spend a significant amount of my time conducting valuations specific, specifically for tax purposes, both federal and international purposes. I now would like to introduce Mark Young, who's one of our speakers. Great, thanks, thanks, Phil. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Mark Young. Uh, thanks for joining us this more uh, this afternoon or morning, I guess, depending on your time zone. Um, to give you a little bit about my background, I'm a federal income tax partner in the Alvarez and Marsal tax practice. I've been with the firm for about 10 years now and really specialize and focus on federal income tax planning, compliance, and tax accounting matters. It's somewhat of a you know, pretty broad spectrum and I've done quite a bit of work uh, in the fixed asset and cost segregation areas, areas throughout my uh, career. Thanks, Mark. Next, I'd like to introduce Tom Popovich. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, my name is Tom Popovich. I'm a director in Alvarez and Marcel's Valuation Practice. I'm, I'm based out of Chicago. Uh, I, I began my career as a, as a process engineer uh, in the engineering field. Uh, later spent some time as a, as a project manager for a residential builder. And most recently, the bulk of my career has been in the, the fixed asset space, uh, performing fixed asset valuations, cost segregation studies, and asset dispositions. Tom, thank you. So um, we're through the introductions and the administrative items. Let's jump right into the content of the webinar. 
As everyone knows, the, the topic of today's webinar is specifically to discuss asset disposition regulations. However, before we do that, we thought it would be helpful for everyone on the webinar to, to at least get a brief description of the overall tangible personal property regulations to at least provide a perspective on really the bigger picture and, and where and how do the asset disposition regulations fit into the overall tangible personal property regulations. I'm going to ask Mark Young to give us a, a high-level background on the overall tangible personal property regulations. Sure. Thanks, Bill. Um, I, you know, I think, you know, just to carry on to what, what Phil mentioned as far as, you know, sort of the approach to this, to this webinar is, is that we really want to focus on the practical aspect. So, you know, what I'd like to do just up front is just talk about, just give you a context of, of where we are uh, with the repair regulations and the corresponding uh, recent final uh, disposition regulations but really focusing on the practical aspects and, you know, um, you know, just sort of in the spirit of the holidays, I guess, you know, what the holidays are all about is just focusing on what's practical, right? <laughs> you know, so, so and if you don't buy that, I think right around the corner for many of you, and including myself, there's the tax provision impact, you know, to be taken into account for tax provision purposes, if not already considered, as well as the, from a compliance perspective, um, that'll be coming right around the corner as well. So there'll be things that we need to do whether it's 3115 filings, uh, certain elections, and whatnot. Um, so what we'd like to do is really focus on the practical, what needs to be done, what, what does not need to be done, uh, and how to get it done. Uh, so really focusing on, you know, the, the practical aspects. Uh, so with that being said, I'll just, let's just step back for a little bit just to talk briefly about the background. Um, you know, in, in this space, in, in, in the, the space uh, potential personal property, um, you know, there's been over, the, over many years uh, controversy and dispute between taxpayers and the IRS with respect to, you know, what are properly expensed items and properly capitalized items in, in, with respect to tangible personal property costs. Um, you know, like, for example, repairs and maintenance, improvements, and so forth. And so several years ago, um, the Treasury started issuing proposed regulations, and, and over the years they've issued in more and more. And I guess most recently, or somewhat most recently, there's, there were the temporary regulations in 2011, and then as many of you know, there in 2000, late 2013, there were the final um, repair regulations, tangible personal property regulations, and as well as proposed disposition regulations. And we'll, we'll talk about those as, as those um, those proposed disposition regulations have since been finalized and some uh, additional guidance has come out. So in addition to that, I guess one thing I'd like to mention is, you know, during this whole time frame or in this recent period between, I guess, two, really 2000, 2012 and, 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 and until about 2014, you know, the, the IRS, LB&I uh, division issued this directive, basically, you know, as a moratorium or stand down on auditing these, uh, auditing issues in this space for the most part. And, you know, that, that moratorium is, is going to be coming off. Um, so um, we can expect, I would expect over the, over, over the coming, you know, years that there, there's going to be more focus from examiners going back, looking at the, looking at these, looking at what you've done from an expense versus a capitalization, capitalization perspective and how that, how that syncs up with uh, the repair regulations. So, you know, where are we now? You know, now we're, we have final regulations that were enacted in late 2013, uh, the, tangible, the quote, the repair regulations, as I often refer to them, as many people do. And then they, the proposed regulations that were issued at the time have now been since finalized recently. Um, these, these regulations are generally effective for tax years beginning on or after January 1, 2014, and they cover a, no, a number of areas, many, of area, many areas that you you may have heard, you know, listened in on other webinars or presentations, and we're not going to cover all of them, but I'll just, you know, just go through just to give you, a, you know, a high-level overview of the repair regs. Dealing with, you know, with repairs and maintenance, materials and supplies, you know, capital expenditures and amounts, you know, paid for improvements thereof, amounts paid for acquisition um, of tangible personal property, things of, things of that nature, as well as dispositions, and that's really where we're going to focus our, our time today. Um, and, and along with that came um, certain elections, 
and accounting method changes that have been, you know, spelled out in various rev procs that have, that have come out um, since this time, and we'll go through some of those in more detail. Um, and some of, the, some of the ones you may be familiar with, you know, the de minimis safe harbor, um, which I'll touch on just at the end, just, just as a reminder, since we are at that, at that time of year um, where it's important to get, make sure that that's in place. Uh, cap, election for capitalization of materials and supplies and, and then, then dispositions. Um, so with that, let's look at, let's, let's jump to the partial disposition election and the late partial disposition election. Uh, and how they how they may, may benefit you, how they apply, um, and what and, and what you need and what you would need to be considering and what you would need to be doing um, at this point. Um. So, Mark, thank you for the overview on the tangible property regulation. So, Mark, now walk us through, if you can, really the the heart of the matter here some of the description and details of the asset disposition regulations, again, from a high level so everybody on the webinar can walk out with a, with a practical view of, of what needs to be done. Sure. I, mean, I think it's, you know, I guess it's almost step one, you know, what is a disposition? A disposition occurs when there's an, when ownership of an asset is transferred, when the asset is permanently withdrawn, withdrawn from use. And that can occur in, in many different ways, you know, sale, retirement, abandonment, or whatnot, and you know, for these purposes, we're really looking at uh, and focusing on the opportunities presented by the partial disposition. And and really here, uh, what I'm focusing focusing on and, and really meaning by that is when you say, for example, you have a renovation. You know, you 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 expend you expend some cost, and you, so your a replacement cost or renovation or whatnot, and you're disposing of an asset. You know, so in, in, as you put in that new asset, you're taking out something. You're taking out something, and so that that's really what we're we're looking at from a partial disposition perspective. And there's a couple ways that you can take advantage of this um, this partial disposition. One is the partial disposition election, which is an annual election. It's not an accounting method change, and it's made made in the in the year in which the disposition occurs. Um, and, and that, that would be the, the year in which you would take a loss on the disposition uh, of that asset or component or whatnot, depending on the set of circumstance. And there's also this late partial disposition election, which some of you may recall um, was there was a sort of a push last year um, that this was it, it, this was an opportunity that had that you had to take advantage of um, for your 2013 year end. Recently, that's been extended. To 2014, and what that is is an election that's made under, under uh, the Rev Proc that they're providing you the ability to make a change in accounting method, something that would other not other otherwise not be a change in accounting method, um, to go ahead and make a change in accounting method to take the benefit of a late partial disposition. So basically, looking back in time and looking at at assets that are on your fixed asset ledger that have been essentially disposed of, uh, been replaced, whether it's via renovation or or, some, or by some other um, by some some other um, action that you've taken. Um, so. Mark, very good. Can you add to that and maybe provide us a little bit of a just to pull it all together, a, a bit of a roadmap. Actually before, actually, before we do that, uh, I think we have a polling question. Um, so, just, uh, I don't know if you're seeing on your screen yet. Uh, okay, it's just popping up. Yeah. Has, a company, has, has your company assessed the impact of the repair regulations and or the benefit of the asset disposition regulations? Okay. And we have A, yes, B, no, C, not sure. So, if at this point, if you could just um, submit your answer. And we'll give everybody about 30 seconds or so to do so. And this is the first of the four polling questions. And as we, as everybody's responding to the poll, one of the terms that I wanted to, to, to get out now is the, you'll hear us talking about ghost assets. So as we use that term, it's probably a good idea to 
to define that now. A ghost asset is an asset that is still on the tax fixed asset ledger, still being depreciated, but it's not actually in service. So it's not there. And since it's not there, that is why we call it a ghost asset. So I want to get that term out there now for everybody because you will hear that term frequently throughout the rest of the presentation, and that really is the crux of the matter here, looking at ghost assets. Okay. With that, okay. With that being said, why don't we move forward to the next slide. Actually, here, I'm going to push out. Actually, just for your benefit, I'm actually getting it to work. I'm having a little technical difficulties, <laughs> but pushing out the benefit or the uh, poll results to you, which... Uh, So at this point, I'm, I don't know that it's pushing out. Well, essentially, 47%, 48% indicated yes, that your company has assessed the impact of the repair regulations. Um, and 29% said no, and 22% said not sure. So thank you for, for that polling question. And, um, and okay, there, there are those results are coming out. So, Mark, can you... Take us to the next step, just to, so we can put everything in perspective. And we put up here on the screen a graph of the tangible personal property and disposition flow chart, just so everybody on the webinar can get a full understanding of how all the pieces fit together and, and what the process looks like. Sure. And with this slide, what I wanted to do is I'm more of a visual person. And so what I wanted what was hope, hopefully you could gain from this slide and is, you know, just Looking at your tangible personal property costs, you know, at the very top we have a deductible or a repair. So say for example you, you incur a deductible, deductible repair cost, that, that cost by its nature and by, by what I just mentioned, it's, it's going to be deductible. So the original basis is just going to continue being depreciated and the repair cost will be deducted. And that's not really what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is the, the lower two items, you know, the current year for what for current year disposals and you know disposals in prior years. So looking at that, the second blue box. Um, in that case, you know, in the case where you have a current year expenditure that is capitalized, and I'm using these terms repair or improvement really loosely in this context, but in, in the case where you have an, a cost where under the under the repair regulations you have to capitalize it. You know, when you, when you do that, whether it's like via renovation or something along those lines, you have you have an option. You have an option to make a partial disposition election, or to not make a partial disposition election. If you make a partial disposition election, you would write off the basis of what was determined to be the, the, the tax basis of what was determined to be disposed of, and you would continue to depreciate the new cost, which would include the you know the, the expenditures that you 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 know you incurred. Um, in that renovation. Um, if, you, if you made no partial disposition election, you would just continue to depreciate all the costs. So in, in a sense, you sort of have this, you know, ghost asset or stranded basis issue that, that uh, Phil was referring to. Um, alternatively, if you looking back, and this is where there's a really, I think, in, in many cases, a substantial opportunity um, from a tax perspective, is looking at prior year, Okay, if we had certain costs that we capitalized as part of a renovation or, or, or so forth, you know, we have this opportunity to make a late partial disposition and for at least a limited period of time. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the, that limited period of time really applied to 2013. Under the most recent guidance, they've extended that to apply for the 2014 year, which is really tax years beginning before 1-1-2015. If you make that late partial disposition election, um, then you essentially get a loss on that disposition, the, the portion, the, the basis of what was considered to be disposed of, and you'd have a 481 adjustment as a change in accounting method. Um, so, I mean, I think, the, I think the key here is, one thing to remember is that this aspect here is, is time sensitive. And I, and I, and I think looking, looking back at just, you know, Anecdotally, from my experience, I think a lot, you know, given the, how busy tax departments are, you know, a lot, a lot of taxpayers didn't take, necessarily take advantage of this. 
um, in 2013, and I think this is sort of a sort of a, of a reprieve, if you will, to to look at it again and see if um, there's a there's a benefit to be taken. Um, and uh, we had that we had that ability through the 2014 tax year. And Mark, we had a bit. Our experience was a bit of a mad dash up to September 15th of this year to get these analyses completed. And probably best to try to avoid, since we do have some leeway now, probably best to try to avoid pushing up against the deadline in, into this tax year. Well, Mark, thank you very much for the overview. Now what we'd like to do is talk about what are the benefits of the asset disposition regulations and of conducting an asset disposition study. Essentially, the benefit is it's a net present value savings that you can generate through the ability to deduct the disposed assets now, rather than continuing to depreciate the assets over their remaining depreciable lives. So if anybody's seen uh, or had experience with a cost segregation study, it, it's a similar presence, uh, s similar situation where you're accelerating that benefit. What we've done on the slide is we've provided just a, a generic example, a table, that highlights how the benefit is derived. And as we walk through this, if you look at some of the components, when you're done with the asset disposition analysis, you will have an estimate of the tax basis of the disposed assets. What do you do with that then? Well, what we have here is we've outlined a little bit over a million dollars of tax basis associated with disposed assets. Those assets have a remaining depreciable life of 15 years. We've made some assumptions here. We've used a 6.5% discount rate. We've assumed a 35% tax rate. Using those assumptions, the ability to deduct that little over $1 million now, rather than continuing to depreciate over another 15 years, provides a net present value savings of approximately $116,000. So essentially what this table is telling us is that if you were in this situation where you had a little bit over a million dollars in disposed assets with a 15-year remaining depreciable life, you could generate a net present value savings of $116,000. So essentially, that is the end result benefit that you can generate. Mark, I, I want to bring Mark in here for, for a minute because there are other aspects of this that can be addressed at the same time. So you're taking the time to conduct an asset disposition study. The question is, are there other benefits you can generate? And, and we think the answer is yes. One, you could look at a cost segregation study. And I, I think in general what Mark is going to touch upon is using this as a good time to, to clean up your tax success at Ledger in general. Mark, could you just... Yeah, and your... I think just briefly, you know, as, as you go through this exercise, you know, and with, and with the, some of the latitude that's provided by the, the guidance, that uh, th there's an opportunity here to you clean up some of your fixed asset, your fixed asset ledger, um, following 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 accounting method change, and, and and get audit protection in 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 many or most cases. So I think you know there's multiple benefits from you know there's one of, of trying to you know, with respect to the partial disposition or late partial disposition election of getting a current tax benefit. Um, there's a, there's also the the benefit of just getting thing getting things in order, getting some audit protection as, as, as you make uh, changing, changes in accounting methods. So that's one thing to think about too, and, and it's one thing that you might think about as doing as part of, you know, as part of a full analysis. We have some real life examples where we conducted an asset disposition analysis, took those assets off the books, deducted that, and at the same time went through and, and essentially recategorized some of the assets that were still remaining on the tax fixed asset ledgers and accelerating the depreciation on, on those assets. So uh, definitely something to think about. Now we have, now we get to the point of saying, we now know the benefits of a study. What type of companies 
should really consider a study. It, it's not for everyone. Obviously, there are going to be specific characteristics that you'd want to look out for to determine if your company would be a good candidate for an asset disposition study. And there are essentially three characteristics to look for. One, ownership of the building. Obviously, you have to have the right to depreciate the assets for this to have any benefit. Two, you've conducted renovations. Those renovations could have been many years in the past, could have been recent, could have been five, ten years ago. The renovations obviously are important because as you conduct re renovations, you are likely replacing assets, and those assets may still be on the fixed asset ledger. And the last characteristic is that you are in a tax-paying position. Therefore, in order to benefit from the deduction, you want to be in a positive income position, so therefore you, you are able to reduce your effective tax rate. So you look at those three characteristics. What type of companies are ideal candidates for an asset disposition study? And we put some photos up there, and if you look at the photos at the top, the Las Vegas Strip, casinos and hotels are, are excellent candidates for this. The next photo is an assisted living facility. And if you start to think about the characteristics of, just to begin with, casinos, hotels, assisted living facilities, they really personify the three primary characteristics in that it, there's ownership of properties, there are usually continuous renovations, and they're in a tax-paying position. And then as we move right to left, it's a photo of a manufacturing facility. Next to that is a restaurant. You can think about restaurant chains, for example, um, thinking about all the different renovations that may occur. And last, all the way to the left, is a shopping mall. So again, you, this is not an exhaustive list here. So it, it's not to say if your company is not on this list that they can't take the benefit. This is just to highlight the companies that we would expect to see more often than not want to consider in asset disposition study. Okay, so at this point we have an, another polling question. Uh, as the polling question comes up on your screen, I'll go ahead and begin to read it out. What do you see the impact uh, of the asset disposition regulations being to your company? A, immaterial, B, material, C, not sure. And I'll give you a few seconds to uh, submit your answer. And then we'll, we'll push the responses out so everyone can see what the consensus is. And as we wait for the results to be tabulated, we will next segue into how to measure the benefit. Okay, so the, the results should be coming out shortly. Uh, it's actually about an equal tie, uh, being that the impact uh, is immaterial. 41% said immaterial. 41% said not sure. And 17% thought it would be uh, material. So, very interesting. So with that, we'll, we'll move on to the next slide. So, we've talked about the background of the disposition regulations, we've talked about what types of companies can benefit. Now we want to get into how do you measure the benefit. And let's assume that your company has met the three criteria we just discussed and, and you really want to pursue an asset disposition study. The big question is, do you automatically move forward and conduct a full study? Uh, the answer could be yes, the answer could be no. The one thing that you probably do not want to do is blindly go forward and conduct a study. And the reason that we, we state this is that 
you could end up spending a significant amount of time, effort, and cost to conduct a full-blown asset disposition study, only to find out at the end that there really isn't much of a benefit. And maybe it was because it turned out there were minimal ghost assets on the, on the tax-fixed asset ledger, maybe because of the dynamic of the property, there just isn't enough benefit there. So what we typically recommend is first conducting an asset disposition diagnostic. This is a high-level approach. It's a high-level diagnostic. And the goal of this is, one, for, foremost, to assess the potential benefit from a full study. The approach is essentially designed to provide you with insight on the potential benefit using minimal information and, and really not taking much of an effort. So it's designed to be easy to implement, to be informative, and not to, to not take up too much time. It's a diagnostic, so you don't want to have to spend too much time, but you do want direction in terms of the potential benefit associated with the full study. What type of information is typically required? One, a tax fixed asset ledger. So, so number one, the first piece of information is something that's readily available. And that's the theme that you'll hear from us throughout the asset disposition diagnostic, readily available information. Two, high-level building specifications. For example, year built, wall construction type, um, square feet. So again, information regarding the building that is readily available. Once that information is gathered, it's then a two-step process. And just to give a frame of reference, this type of analysis, once the data are gathered, this is a day-long, this could be just a day-long exercise, essentially. If the data are in good condition, it's, it's not a very tedious exercise. And it does provide directionally what type of benefit one could derive. What I'm going to do here is we've outlined what is entailed, but what I'd like to do is walk through an example of an asset disposition diagnostic, and Tom is going to cover that example, and in doing so, he'll also discuss what's on this slide here, the step one, the step two. So we thought it would be more helpful rather than just reading off the steps that one would take, have Tom walk through an actual example and, and put some numbers behind that. Tom, if you could, please. Sure. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, and as Phil mentioned, we'll kind of get into the, we'll, 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 uh, we'll get into the, to the, to the nitty gritty of the, of the diagnostic. We'll, we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper into the mechanics of it and, uh, and explore how it can, how it can, uh, how it can be beneficial. Um, for these examples, for this example, we're going to go through, and, the, and then the process of actually doing the disposition analysis. We'll, we'll use a hotel as our as our subject property throughout, just for consistency's sake. Well, the first step entails a review of the fixed asset ledger, an application of trend factors to estimate the cost to replace the building. Now, the trend factors are applied to the original cost basis on the ledger based upon their in-service date. And, and right here, you've got a, you've got a very um, pared-down example of a fixed asset listing. So you would apply the trend factor to this 12.550 million cost number at the acquisition date of 1991 and trend that cost to today's dollars. It could be 12 million, it could be 14 million, it could be 20 million. Um, and several reliable trend sources uh, that we utilize are Marshall Valuation Services, uh, they provide cost construction indices, uh, as well as uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, their producer price index. Both are, are very reliable sources for, for trending information. So we go through the process, we trend the, we trend the fixed asset listing, and what do we come up with? We come up with a replacement cost that it says it's $15 million. 
Now, what does this mean? We're not saying that the building is $15 million. We're saying that the assets on the fixed asset listing are have a replacement cost of $15 million. So there's a bit of a disconnect between what's actually in service and what is on the fixed asset listing. We'll hop on to the next slide here. The second step entails, as Phil mentioned, utilizing some of those high-level business, or sorry, building metrics, such as square footage, construction type, location. We're going to use all that information, and we're going to develop the replacement cost of the building. Similarly, some, some very reliable sources are RS means and Marshall Valuation Services. Both are, are called out in the IRS cost segregation audit guide uh, as reliable sources, and, and we, we tend to tend to rely on those, those same sources. So this, in essence, means that we're calculating the cost of the building in a vacuum. We are looking at the metrics of the building in place. We're going through the process of estimating replacement cost, and we're coming up with a number. In, in this same example, we're, we're going to use $10 million. So as you can see, there's a significant difference between the trended replacement cost and the calculated replacement cost in a vacuum. So what does this tell us? It tells us that there's the potential in the fixed asset listing to be ghost assets. The ghost assets are essentially the difference between calculating that replacement cost in a vacuum and what is actually on the ledger. Is this the, du the, the deductible amount, you ask? No, this is not the deductible amount. What the diagnostic is proposing, based on these two based on the two metrics of the 10 million and the 15 million, is that there is a potential that half of the original building, when looking at the replacement cost, could have been replaced over its time, over its uh, over its life. It, and you translate that back to the tax basis, you could be talking about a, a, a significant a significant savings in terms of a deduction. So with the information, with this information and a deeper qualitative dive into the data, a more informed decision can be made. And what do I mean by, by qualitative data? And we've looked at all of the quantitative data. We've looked at here are the numbers. We've got 15 million in terms of replacement costs from the ledger. We've got 10 million uh, in terms of replacement costs when we look at it on a standalone basis. There are other factors that come into play, as Phil mentioned, such as, well, hypothetically the building original building component could be 95% depreciated. Is there really a benefit for you to go through the analysis when you've only got 5% of the basis remaining? Likely not. Were some of the, addition, the additional assets added throughout the years not in fact replacements or, or replacements of, of disposed assets but betterments to the property? That could skew the results of the, of the $15 million. And so that's why you have to couple the quantitative analysis with that qualitative analysis to make sure that that you've got, got the whole picture in, 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 terms of, in terms of doing the diagnostic. And, and, and Tom, I think that last part, the qualitative part, is a very important point because we've encountered situations where on the surface it looks like from a replacement cost point of view there are a significant level of ghost assets. But we, when we then transition that to the qualitative analysis and we start to look at the composition of some of the assets that may, no, that may no longer be in service, if we're finding that there are two years left on the depreciable life, one year, three years, all of a sudden what appears to be a potential benefit may not be much of a deduction at all because to Tom's point, it could be that most of those assets, although still on the ledger, have very minimal tax basis remaining. So. The message we're delivering here is the diagnostic can't be essentially executed in a vacuum. It's not completely mechanical. You do need to take a step back and bridge that gap between replacement cost and, and tax basis. Okay, and I think with that, I think we have a polling question coming up. It should be appearing momentarily.
So the, the poll question number three, what are your expectations on IRS scrutiny related to the repair regulations? And you have four choices on this one. Heavy, moderate, not much, or not sure. So we'll give everybody 30 seconds here to provide their responses. And as everyone does that, and as they tabulate the votes, we're next going to move into, oh, well, actually, I'll let Mark jump in with the results here. We, we just pushed out. So 16% are expecting heavy scrutiny, a little over 45% moderate, 16 not much, and close to 23% not sure. So a little bit... Uh, almost majority on the moderate scrutiny. Yeah, and I, I think that makes sense. I mean, I think, you know, given that the the, the IRS directive, the LBNI directive, you know, come, with that coming off, and um, I think there will be more scrutiny going forward, and particularly with respect to the, you know, as, as you consider when, when, when it gets down to compliance time and filing 3115s, the ones that, you know, as you assess which ones you, you should make, um, you know, the IRS has a is I think they're developing and they're in gathering what they would anticipate to be, you know, typical 3115 kind of changing in accounting methods. So I think to the extent, you know, that you have no changes in accounting methods, and this is really looking beyond just a partial disposition because these are sort of these are like our elections, uh, um, in a sense. So to the extent you have no 3115. Um, Changes in accounting method. I think that should, could be a red flag uh, to the service. So I, I mean, I, th I think a good uh, thorough analysis as far as what what changes in accounting method you, you, do you need to make. Just as looking at the repair regs as a whole, and, I, and at that point, I think that there will be increased scrutiny as the IRS starts to go back and look at these issues in, in, in prior years and so forth. So with that, we'll move on to the next slide. So now you've conducted your diagnostic, and based on the results of the diagnostic, looking at the potential for ghost assets, you've decided that there's more than enough potential net present value savings benefits to move forward with a full-blown asset disposition study. So now what we'd like to do is walk through a few items. Give everyone an understanding on the webinar what is considered. What do you need to consider as part of an asset disposition study, number one? And what steps are entailed in that study? Just to give everyone a flavor for what you can expect, what you're looking at. And as part of that, we are also going to provide an example. I'm going to ask Tom to provide First, the overview of what's considered in a study and, and essentially what are some of the steps that are taken. Tom? Sure. Yeah, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly go over some of these considerations and some of the steps, and then we can get into, into the process and, and, and mechanically really how, how, do we, how do we get through this, how, do, how is the actual um, disposition analysis performed. Um, so some of our considerations, a, a high level, we, we want to understand past renovations, disposals, repairs. Um, and then we get down to the, really the crux of what we're doing. Take a step further, we want to identify the assets that have been disposed. And what are, and of the ones that are still on the fixed asset ledger, sometimes we can actually accomplish this through looking at what are some of the replacement assets, because they will likely have replaced like-kind assets in the past. So that, that can be a, a definite help for us. Um, we then use various methods to try and estimate the tax basis of the assets that have been disposed and then finally wrap that all up with, with a narrative report that clearly clearly explains the analysis and, and provides all the supporting documentation uh, we require. So I'm, I'm going to expand on some of, the, some of the, the steps a little bit further and get into a little bit of our diligence that we do throughout the process. Uh, we begin with the most logical place. We start with the fixed asset listing. Uh, we review the asset listing to understand how the tax basis corresponds with the assets that are actually in service. In addition, we look at what capitalizations have been made over the years. 
um, a site visit can be very helpful through our, through our diligence process, helping us understand the subject property. Um, we will review the, you know, we, we can review the available construction data, such as drawings, cost information, blueprints. All these can help us understand the magnitude of the assets being disposed, the replacement assets, or both. Additionally, we'll look at invoice costs, detail costs when available. Um, again, we'll be using, we'll use reasonable methods to estimate the tax basis of the current assets being depreciated. Um, and, 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 and that of the ones that should be deducted. Tom, let me ask a question. I know we get this asked ask this question all the time. Uh, site inspection. Let's just say the records are in phenomenal condition or a company has um, 50 different buildings and it's, it's not practical to go to each building for which they're conducting an asset disposition disposition study. How important is the site inspection? Is, does it have to be done? Should it be done? Can you just give everyone some insight as to your view on that? Sure, and this will, this will, be, an, this will be an easy one. Uh, as you mentioned, the data is, the, is, is really the, the deciding factor. <laughs> if we can get the analysis performed without a site inspection, it is definitely not a 100% necessary um, item. Um, it, it, with the proper data, uh, it, it, it can be performed without it. So it's simply a matter of, you know, what, what kind of data we're looking at. If it's going to help us, you know, do the, do the analysis um, in, the, in the most accurately possible, we would recommend it, um, but it's definitely not a, a requirement. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Tom. Now we're going to push to an actual example, again, because we, we think it, it's, much easier to follow along what actually needs to be done in a full asset disposition study. We're going to, again, use our hotel that we utilize in the diagnostic analysis. And I'm going to lay down the background for the hotel, and Tom's going to jump in and talk about what actually should be done. And essentially, the background is the hotel made numerous renovations over the years, we put a couple photos up top. If you look at some typical areas of a hotel, guest rooms on the left, in the center we have a lobby. On the right-hand side we have a photo of the restaurant. And as you can imagine, and, and why we, we focus on hotels for the example, is that these areas go through renovations pretty regularly. So the probability of ghost assets on the tax fixed asset ledger for these types of areas could be higher than in, than in most cases. And the assumption we're making is that as renovations were conducted, the new asset costs were all capitalized, but the assets that were physically removed from the building as part of the renovations are still sitting on the fixed asset ledger. So the renovations created ghost assets because the disposed assets are not in service anymore. They're physically gone, but they are still being depreciated on the tax fixed asset ledger. So Tom, could you walk us through the example, walk us through the process, and we put some numbers down as well in some of the following slides to help highlight. Sure. Yeah. No. No. Thanks, Phil. I'm gonna I'm gonna just get right into the kind of the meat and potatoes of the actual calculations and how they are how they are applied in practice. Uh, I, you know, we, we we start off as we discussed with our with our general diligence. You know, we want to identify the assets that are being disposed or part of part of renovations, past renovations. Uh, we want to go through our, our 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 general diligence of looking at whatever information that is available from our client to be able to to um, most accurately perform the, the analysis. Uh, in some cases, detailed information can and will be limited. I mean, it, it's going to be nobody's records are perfect, especially when you're going back 10 or 20 years. Um, to that point, you know, personnel who are familiar with you know, project managers who are there during the construction, contractors that still might be, um, that might be uh, available to speak to who could, who could give a little bit more color, the, those are all great people to talk to, and, and many times they can help bridge that gap 
uh, from A to B from an in information perspective. So mechanically, how do we perform the disposition? Let's use two assets as a basic example. One asset is the original hotel constructed and booked in a single line item. The other is a replacement asset that results in the disposal of a portion of that original hotel construction. It could be whatever you want to think of, a roof, um, whatever example you, you, want, you want to think of. We begin by getting the two assets in a like time period is, is, is the key. The guidance speaks to bringing the replacement asset to the same time period as the original asset. We term this as back trending, essentially. Uh, similar to the, the approach we talked about in trending forward the asset to get to replacement cost. In this case, we're trending the replacement asset back to original cost. You're essentially, as I said, you're essentially reverse, reverse indexing the newer asset back to what it would have hypothetically cost at the same time that, that the hotel was constructed. Now, there are several, several reasonable trending sources. Again, we look to Marshall Valuation Services construction cost indexes, or we look at the Bureau of, of Labor and Statistics price index. I, we should note that there can be issues with this method that, that, that's laid out in the, uh, in the final regs. And um, we can walk through an example here, and you'll, you'll see why most of our examples touch on replacement cost of the asset. Now, the main, the main issue you can run into when backtrending is a situation where the original cost of the building on the tax books does not actually represent the original construction costs, but instead, uh, for instance, an allocated purchase price. If the building asset on the books represents, represents a market value or a depreciated dollar amount, backtrending can lead to slightly, slightly misleading results. So I'll, I'll give a very quick example. Uh, let's say it's the year 2000. You, you have a building that's constructed for $10 million at the, first, at the beginning of the year. Now, later in that same year, we're, we're looking at a real estate bubble. I'm sure many people can remember the, the one we, we just had. The building sells for $8 million. So you're the taxpayer here. You've got an $8 million asset on your books. Fast forward 10 years, you decide to, and we use it in our example all the time, replace the roof of the building. Now, you've got a one-line item $8 million asset from 2000 on your books. You, you, you replace the new roof. You go through the process of back-trending that roof, and let's say for, for round numbers' sake, you get to $1 million for that roof at, at the year 2000. So you naturally you say, okay, well, I've got one out of $8 million. I've got one-eighth of that, of that original asset has been disposed. And, and that's where we get the hang-up, because the actual dollar value of that original construction for that building is $10 million. And so you'll be using a one-eighth proportion rather than the one-tenth proportion you should be using if it was not an allocated cost from you know, a prior purchase. And that's why we say, and that's why we go through the process of replacement costs. Bring all the assets to the same time period today and then do the allocation for situations like that. Uh, now, that's a, now the, the slide here has a fairly straightforward example. Uh, you've got your $17 million of replacement cost for the original construction, $2.5 for the, for the disposals. And in, in this case, this was our hotel example with carpets and wall covering. The proportion is 14.7. You take that proportion against the basis of the original construction, and now we have our deduction amount. So I, I'm going to, as we're, as we're coming close to, uh, close to the end of our time, I'm going to pass it off to, to Mark here. Yeah, so we have a polling question here. So what are the characteristics of a company that should consider the asset disposition rules? One, own property. Two, conduct renovations in prior years. Three, in a tax paying position. Or four, all of the above. And while everyone is answering those questions, we've had a few questions that have come across and we would, we're gonna answer a few of those prior to the webinar ending. So we've got some great questions that came in. We're gonna address those next actually. And then with the time that we have remaining, we'll, we'll wrap up from there. So as you can see, we'll come on your screen soon and we'll just jump over pretty quick, but obviously the answer on that one is all of the above. 91% uh, said 90, uh, all of the above. So with that, we'll move on to the next slide. And Mark, can we address, 
you want to address those questions now, if possible? Right. I think we'll address. I know we've had a number of questions come in, and, and uh, I'll try to get through. I think just try to get through the, some of the filing requirements real quick, and, and feel free. You can reach out to out to me. Um, so I'm, I'm more on the tax side, tax technical side, with, with respect to accounting methods. And changes. feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. But just to touch real briefly on you know the procedures that are set for in the most recent RevProc 2014-15. Uh, that deals with the automatic changes in accounting methods, among other things, but with respect to the, the partial or the disposition uh, uh, elections. So, um, just real quick, late partial disposition election, that's one that's considered a, a change in accounting method. Again, remember that has a limited time frame. That's one thing that we need to be, would need to be dealt with during the 2014 year. Um, uh, the partial disposition election is not a change in accounting method. It's something you look at on an annual basis, and um, so it's an election that's filed on your on your return. Uh, but no statement uh, no statement is required. The election is made at the time of the of the return, but it's no statement is actually required. Um, and one one just real quick mention I'll, I, that I'll I'll say here is with respect to audit protection. Um, generally, you know, as you as you know, when you file 3115, you get audit protection. Uh, in most cases, uh, unless you're under examination or the, the issue is pending and whatnot. And under the, under RevProc 2014-54, there are certain uh, scope limitations, but if you're in exam, the issue is pending and so forth, you may not get audit protection. So let me move on to the next slide. And just talk about some of these considerations and, and, and maybe address a couple questions that have come through. Uh, general asset, just in general asset accounts. That's you know, it's within the, the realm of this, um, but it's really beyond. It's probably for another web, web, webinar, if you will. Um, one question that came up with respect to the, the tax provision impact, and and you know, yes, the the impact of this in many respects is is timing, but along with the timing aspect. So just for a quick example, if you had, if if you get a big benefit currently and it reduces your taxable income, it could have implications elsewhere. For example, Section 199, which would be a rate where I can, uh, affect a tax rate item, uh, impact item. So even though what we're looking at is a timing issue, um, it can have implications on your rate at least year to year. Over time, it should even out because it, it, it's a timing difference. It's a firm difference. It's sort of it's just reflected over time. So you might have some more variability in your, in your effective tax rate. Um, so with, with that, um, so with that, why don't we uh, move on to? I think we had. We're going to do takeaways in a minute, but we had one other question. Um, if there have been significant level, if you have a significant level of fixed assets, and the prior renovations are not easily identified in the system, is a partial disposition even? Is it doable? And the answer to yes. that is yes. So. I can tell you just from our own experience, we've worked on these engagements with all different types of data in different varying conditions. So the answer to that question is absolutely yes. You can, even if your records are in, are in certain condition, um, you've got a significant value on your fixed asset ledger, but you can't identify, the answer is yes. You still can go in and take the election on this. And it, it, it is an analysis that can be conducted. And the last Last part, um, takeaways, very quickly, just to wrap this up. What, what do you want to walk away with today knowing? If you own property, you've conducted renovations, and you're in a tax paying position, you should consider an asset disposition study. The window to take advantage of this closes with the following of your 2014 tax return. Very important point. We recommend conducting a diagnostic to assess the, the benefit. And as Mark had mentioned earlier, there could be additional considerations such as a cost seg segregation analysis or just cleaning up your fixed asset ledger in general at the same time. That's right. So at, at this point, I, I know we're running short on time. I guess, Phil, do you want to just handle some of the, the housekeeping matters just to make sure that everyone gets their CPE credit and so forth? Yeah. So. It, we need to ensure that everybody has responded to at least three or four questions to, to qualify for CPE credits. And certificates? And then, yeah, then, then we will be issuing certificates. So everyone that, that, that 
sends in there, sends in the, and that we have record of via the system that this, this responds to the requisite questions, we will be getting the certificates out to you so you can have them for your record. In, in A&M, we'll, we will be in touch with everyone to issue those certificates just so everyone knows. We'll be reaching out. And I guess one, just one last thing before we, before we close down um, is, you know, after the new year, we'll be, we will be issuing um, additional additional um, publications and articles and so forth. We have, a, I don't know if, if many of you may be um, subscribers to, we have a tax advisor weekly that we, we deal with various tax issues on a weekly basis, and this will be one that we'll be definitely addressing uh, after the new year. So keep an eye out for that as well as additional webinars. And last item, we, we are receiving additional questions. We are out of time, unfortunately. We will reach out to those of you who have asked questions and we have not yet been able to respond. We will reach back out to you subsequent to the webinar. So again, thank you everyone on the call. Tom, Mark, thank you very much for your insight. And we hope everybody is able to walk away today with at least um, a high level view of the asset disposition regulations. Thank you. Have a great holiday.